So, you know, we continue, as Pastor Tyler was saying, we're continuing on our series on family matters. How many of you know that family matters to God, right? Family matters to God. And when we go home and we close the doors, even though we, the rest of us can't see what's happening in the in behind closed doors, God can see everything that's happening behind closed doors. God goes everywhere with us. And today, I want to, to talk to you about a message called Breaking Unhealthy Cycles. Breaking Unhealthy Cycles. How many of you know that there are cycles that sometimes we can feel trapped in, right? We can feel like we're stuck in these cycles. And, and you're probably wondering, what do you mean by cycles? Cycles. Well, what I mean is uh, a type of, of behavior or a type of habit that sometimes we end up adopting or taking on and, and then we repeat sort of the same mistakes over and over again. And this actually affects how we do life, how we interact in the home, how we interact with our children, how we interact with our, our parents. And so today God wants to speak to us about these unhealthy cycles and help us break them. And how many of you know that we've got a powerful God that can break cycles? Amen? So Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for bringing us today, God. Thank you for what you have prepared for us, Lord God, to give us. We are, we are ready, God, to hear your word, Lord. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, God. Give us a heart that is soft and teachable and moldable, God. And just walk through these aisles right here, Holy Spirit. Speak to our lives. Encounter us here right where we're at. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 So often in families, there are cycles of brokenness and dysfunction that may have been passed down from our parents um, genetically or even in the home, how we do life in the home. A lot of, th a lot of things that we, that we learn that we are actually um, mimicking or doing again are things that we learned in the home. We don't only get physical traits from our parents, right? Our, our eye color, the shape of our nose, um, how big our big toes are, right? We don't only get these physical traits from our parents, but we also get mindsets from our parents. And maybe we get also habits and predispositions and inclinations, right? And addictions, things like that can also be passed down from our parents. Talking about physical traits, there's one physical trait that I'm like, Lord, why? Why didn't I get my mom's toe? So my big toe is exactly like my father's big toe. How many of you have something that is exactly like one of your parents that you kind of wish it was like the other parent, right? Well, that's my big toe. I got my father's big toe. And so when Sammy and I are actually high school sweethearts, and um, I said to myself, I am not going to let this guy see my big toe before we get married, <laughs> right? I'm like, if he gets a look out of my big toe, I think he'll call off the wedding. So always, oh, not never open toe shoes, always closed toe shoes, socks around my high school sweetheart. He never got to see my toes. We got married and then the socks came off, right? It's like, well, you're, you married me now, so you married my big toe also. There are things that we wish we didn't get from our parents, right? There are certain characteristics, physical characteristics, but there's also certain personality characteristics that we kind of wish we didn't get from our parents. There's some positive ones, right, that we get from our parents. From my mother, I got a very positive characteristic in that I'm very hardworking. My mom was a very hardworking woman, and I take that after her. My father is very compassionate, very compassionate. Anything can make that man cry. In Costa Rica, he would drive, and and if there was a woman walking down with, you know, if it was rainy and she didn't have an umbrella, he would stop, give, him, give her his umbrella. And so that compassion was passed down from my dad. But there are certain things that are passed down from our parents that are not necessarily positive. And some of us find ourselves in these negative cycles in our lives because of things that happened even before we were born. And 
The Bible does a great job at explaining what this is and how this looks like and why this is. And if you go with me to the book of Exodus, when you go to the chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to read 5 and 6. Exodus 5 and 6, many of you have probably heard this, this, um, this scripture, and sometimes this scripture is taken out of context, misinterpreted, and it causes bondage in us when we misinterpret the word. But how many of you know that the truth sets us free? So we're going to read the truth about this verse. The word, the word of God says, chapter 20, verse 5 and 6, it says, Do not bow in worship to them. Do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Sometimes when we read this verse, we think that God is in the delivery room and that we are, you know, our mothers are giving birth to us. We come out and then there's a curse on us because of what our parents did or our great grandparents did. That's not what the word of God says. The word of God says is that his, the consequences of the father's iniquity is visited on the third and fourth generation of those who hate God. But how many of you love God? Amen? So if you love God, there is no curse over you. All right? If you love God, there isn't a demon waiting at the delivery room ruining your life, okay? If you love God, the trajectory of your life is already different. Your destiny is already different. But what this verse does say is that there are iniquities, there are inclinations, there are certain habits that are passed down from fathers to sons, from mother to daughters. And where are they passed down? Some of them are genetic, yes. Because scientists have proven through studies on twins that personality, 30 to 60% of our personality, our temperament, how cooperative or hostile we are, how empathetic or cold we are, certain traits in our personality are genetically passed down, 30 to 60% they say. But there are a lot of things that are not passed down through a genetic code, through our DNA. Most of the things are passed down in our living room, right? There isn't a child that is born racist, right? There isn't a child that is born hateful. We learn these things when we're sitting down at our living room, on the couch, in the kitchen. We begin to pass we begin to transfer a mindset into our children by the way that we dialogue, by the way that we converse, the things that we set our minds on. So this iniquity is passed down from fathers to sons and, and, and mothers to daughters through interaction, through what we teach our children, through the values that we hold, through the stories that we tell, through the things that we say about people, about friends, about our pastors, about, about the neighbor. These are things that are passed down. And if a father has a certain way of thinking, it's very likely that the son and daughter will have the same way of thinking. And that's why we have to be careful what we talk about, the dynamic in our home, because what happens is whatever we are imparting, that is the cycle that sometimes our children are trapped in. How many of you have ever felt trapped in a cycle? I remember when I was younger, I felt trapped in a cycle. It was a cycle of shame and rejection and sadness and feeling unworthy and feeling unloved and feeling like if, lo if God showed love to someone else, it's because he loved me less. That is a mindset. That is a way of thinking. That's the way that I, that I learned how to look at the world or interact with a father, interact with my authority because that is what I saw. That is what I, I, I like a sponge, absorbed. That is how I, how I related to others. 
And this changed the way that I was looking at the world, changed it from way, the way that God designed it. But how many of you know today that God can disrupt any unhealthy cycle? That whatever was passed down through our bloodline, through the blood of Jesus, it can be cut off. Yes? That there is hope in the blood of Jesus. That, there, that even though sin entered the world through one man, blessing and everlasting life came through Jesus. Right? And there is no, there, there isn't a, a, such a thing that I'm trapped, that I'm doomed, that nothing will ever change. We can't, we don't, we can't say that with Jesus. With Jesus, there's always hope. With Jesus, there's always a new beginning. With Jesus, there's always a second opportunity. With Jesus, there's power. With Jesus, there's ability. Amen? And that's what God wants to tell us today, church. If you go with me, to Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, Ezekiel 18, 20. This is a, a, very, a very powerful lesson here that the prophet Ezekiel brings to light. Ezekiel 18, 20 to 22, this is what the word of God says. It says, the person who sins is the one who will die. A son won't suffer punishment for the father's iniquity, and a father won't suffer punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous person will be on him, and the wickedness of the wicked person will be on him. But if the wicked person turns from all the sins he has committed, keeps all my statues, and does what is just and right, he will certainly live. He will not die. None of the transgressions he has committed will be held against him. He will live because of the righteousness he has practiced. So this verse brings to light something very important. The first thing is this, that these cycles, these, these negative, toxic cycles that sometimes we find ourselves trapped in are tied to our choices. The Bible says that a child isn't held accountable for the father or the mother's sin. And that a father and mother is not held accountable for the children's sin. Everyone is held accountable for their own choices. And so whatever you do, and whatever cycle you might find yourself in, whatever toxic behavior you might adopted in your life, it's tied to a choice. You can choose to continue on, or you can choose to stop. God gives you the ability to stop. God gives you the ability to disrupt that cycle and say, it stops with me. I'm not repeating this. I am not going to repeat this. I see how much this has costed my parents. I see how much this has ruined our, our, our family life. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to stop. It's going to stop with me. I'm going to make the choice that I'm not gonna repeat this. When I was younger, I had to make a choice that I wasn't going to repeat the same, the same patterns. Because when I look back to, to the people that were before me, I can see a lot of cycles. I can see a lot of inclinations, a lot of iniquity. And those are open doors. And the same way that the enemy tried to tempt my parents, my grandparents, it's the same way he's gonna to try to tempt me. Why? Because he's smart. He's thinking, oh, she's very similar genetically. She's in the same environment. So perhaps I'll do the same type of temptation and she'll fall into the same cycle. But there's a moment when we have to choose and we say no. No, every curse, every cycle, every action is tied to a choice. We have a choice. Number two, what we just read in Ezekiel that teaches us is that no one is trapped in an unbreakable curse. You know, there are people that come and say, man, I just feel like there's a curse over me. I feel like wherever I go, there's like a dark cloud and I can't shake it off. And even though I'm a believer and even though I've accepted Christ, I don't know, but all these bad things happen to me and all these bad things happen in my family and all these bad things happen when I'm here or there. And they feel like there's this curse that is just hanging over them. 
and that is not biblical. We just read it in Ezekiel. It's not biblical. No one is trapped in an unbreakable curse. As soon as you decide to turn from your ways, from doing life the way you were taught to do life, from doing life the way you think you should do life, as soon as you say, you know what, not my way, but God's way. Not my will, but God's will. As soon as you say that, everything is changed. There is no curse over you. God broke that curse at the cross. There is no curse hanging over you. It says, cursed is the one who hangs on a tree. Well, who hung on a tree? Jesus Christ, for your curse, for my curse to be completely broken. Amen? So you're not trapped. Something powerful, miraculous, and supernatural happens when you say, you know what? I'm not going this way anymore. I'm going this way. I'm turning my back away from all of these things that I want to do, all of these uh, instant gratification, these things that I've learned, these ways that I have acted, and I'm turning to the cross. And when that happens, everything, every curse, every cycle can be broken. And number three, what we learn from Ezekiel is that we are each held accountable for our own decisions. We can't blame our parents for our choice. We can't blame our parents for repeating the same mistakes. We don't, as parents, well, you can feel free right now. I know that there's a lot of parents here that you probably are carrying this burden on you. This condemnation, oh man, my child is acting the way he's acting because of what I've done. And then you wake up every single day with the same condemnation and the same guilt and the same thoughts and the same negative mindset. Man, it was me. I messed him up. I messed her up. Well, if you know Jesus, and at one point you said yes to Jesus, and then you began to say, forgive me to, my, to your children. Forgive me for what I've done. Forgive me for what I've said. Forgive me for what I've taught you. You don't have to feel guilty anymore. You don't have to feel condemned anymore. We are all held accountable for our choices now. Every single one of us here is held accountable for what we choose to do with our lives, with what God has given us. God knows that if we continue blaming our parents, we will never be victorious. If we continue living a, a victim mentality, we will never experience victory in Christ. I can't blame my parents. I can't. Yes, there was a lot of suffering. Yes, there was a lot of instability. Yes, there were a lot of things that I learned and picked up on that were not healthy things. But I can't blame them anymore. Why? Because I am going to be held accountable for my choices, my decisions. I have forgiven. And as soon as I forgave those who have hurt me, I am now held accountable to what I am going to do. Because the same forgiveness I received, I have extended. And now I have to live a life that is, worth, not, that is honorable, honoring God. Amen? Yes. None of us are worthy, but God still chose to send his son. And so we choose to respond with obedience and commitment and love. Amen? Amen? So we are each held accountable. We can't place the blame on anyone else. We cannot place that blame on anyone else. There's a story in the Bible about a man. And you know the, the Israelites, they were always caught up in the same cycle. The cycle was idolatry and sexual immorality. God would come and rescue them. They would be, you know, be held captive or, or the, the armies were coming against them and they felt like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? We're going to be defeated. They will call upon the Lord and they would say, God, come, rescue us. We need you. God would come, rescue them. And then he, they would be like, yeah, hallelujah, praise God. And then they would get comfortable again. And then they would go back little by little to the same old habits, to the same old cycles. And in the book of Numbers, chapter 25, there's a story about a guy named Phineas. Right now, in this story, the Israelites are back to the same cycle, the same toxic behavior, 
The same dishonoring God, doing what they wanted to do, gratifying their own, their own flesh and going their own way, deciding their own way of, uh, of doing life. And all of a sudden, there's this plague on the people of Israel. How many of you know that when, they're, when, when, we are going, when we're trapped or we feel trapped or when we're like in this toxic cycle, it's like a plague, right? It comes and it like, it, it just, it ruins families. Sometimes when we are in these cycles, that maybe perhaps it's only us, we're the ones kind of repeating the same behavior, but somehow it starts affecting everyone around us. It's almost like a, like a, like a poison that just begins to poison the minds of everyone around us. And it's like a plague. And this is what was happening right here in the book of, of, of Numbers, chapter 25. Because you know that whenever you say something, whenever you do something, whenever you're caught up in something, in, a, in sort of like these toxic thoughts and words and behaviors, it affects your circle of influence. It affects the people around you. All of a sudden, your children begin to think the same way you think. All of a sudden, that your children begin to act the same way you act, right? I've seen that in my own home. I'm like, I, I've seen all the great things that, that, that I've been able to, to accomplish through God. I've seen all the great things that God has helped me break. But I've also seen those things, those negative things that I have passed down. And I'm like, oh, Lord, help me. Lord, help me how wretched and miserable I am. Because there's times when my kids will show up with a behavior and an attitude. And I'm like, where did that come from? And Sammy's back there like, okay, I don't want to say it. I, I don't want to say where it came from. I'm going to bite my tongue. You know, the other day I decided that I don't, I, I don't want to show my anger. I'm just going to hide it. And that's not good, okay? But I'm just being vulnerable up here. So for all your mommies who are, you know, trying to like figure out how to be more patient and not get angry. So I said to myself, you know what? I have the perfect idea. Every time that I'm angry, what happens is I do something really weird with my forehead. Okay? It's, it does something like this. And so everybody knows when I'm angry in my house. And I'm like, how do I change this? How do I change this so that no one knows? How do I change this, right? So no one knows, right? Because, oh, Belen will, will make a joke and she says, oh, mommy's mad. And why? Because I did this, right? So I'm like thinking in my head, okay, perhaps what I can do is smile. Because if I smile, I can't do that at the same time. Do you see that? So I was coming up with my own strategy, right? Do you ever come up with your own strategy to break a bad cycle, right? How many of you have ever come up with your own strategy, right? And it doesn't work. It just looks creepy because what I was doing was this. <laughs> and then I told Elijah, I'm like, so, and then, so I was like, Elijah, you know, I came up with a perfect way to hide it from you guys so you don't know that mommy's angry is I'm gonna smile. And then I said, because I can't do this and do this at the same time, you know? And see, so he's like, okay, mom, you know, this is kind of creepy. And I'm like, yeah. and so the next day, Elijah said, mom, I, I want some chores, okay? So if you guys need anything on your, like for a kid 12 years old to do in your lawn or whatever, please hire my son. He's all about money. He's all about making money right now. So I'm like, okay, Elijah, this is what I want you to do. All of these books, I want you to take them upstairs. The little ones are gonna fit upstairs, but the big ones only fit in that room. And it was very complicated. I understand the chores that I was giving him. So you could tell that he was just getting upset. Because he's like, why can't it be just like I'll wash the toilet and just be done? And I'm like, but this is what I need. And so he started getting angry. And I'm like, Elijah, you know, I, I don't go to work and tell my boss, well, this is too difficult for me. I just can't do this. And so I could tell Elijah was getting a little bit angry. And then he did this. <sighs> I understood what he was doing. He was trying to hide his anger by smiling in a very creepy way. <laughs> so we do tend to pass down our little things, okay? And sometimes even when we say we're not going to repeat what my mom did or what my dad did, it comes out, right? Like, does it ever come out, okay, or is it just me? Am I the only one that sometimes it just comes out? In, in, in Spanish, 
We call it our, our, our last name, you know? Is that my last, my, my Arias came out, or my Chan came out, or my Rodriguez came out. And so, what I'm trying to say is that even though you try, and you make an effort, and you're like, oh, I'm gonna bite my tongue, right? It comes out. But you wanna know the most important thing that we can teach our children and the most important thing that we can model for our children is forgiveness. It's forgiveness. Because we're gonna make mistakes. And we're gonna, we have to forgive and teach the lifestyle of forgiveness. And say, I'm sorry, look, I made a mistake. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't mean to do that, I'm sorry. I know that I made you feel bad, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And when we teach each other forgiveness, when we give each other grace, right, we can do it better next time. So, where was I? I don't know where I, so Phineas, right? Okay, we're back to Phineas. So, Phineas gets up and he says, wow, there's like a, there, there are 24,000 people that have died because of this disruptive pattern this destructive cycle, these people that are doing these things, it got so bad that there was one man that said, you know what, I don't care, I'm gonna do whatever I wanna do. And he takes this Moabite woman, brings her into the tent in front of the community of people, of the people of Israel, even in front of their leader, Moses. And you could just imagine what this man was gonna go and do in that tent. Because he was like saying, I don't care. I'm going to do whatever I want. This is, this is what I'm going to do, and I don't care who's affected by it. But you know what Phineas did? The first thing that Phineas did, which is something that's going to help us to, to stop any negative cycle, to stop any sinful ways or inclinations, the first thing that Phineas did is he weighed the cost. So if you're taking note, just jot down, weigh the cost. What do you mean by that, Candy? Well, what I mean by that is that Phineas said, you know what, 24,000 people have died. And there's this plague that's running rampant in this, in this community. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a stop to this. I'm gonna put a stop to this. Weigh the cost. Whatever that you're doing right now, that you, you feel like you're, you're trapped in and you can't stop, or you feel like you don't want to stop, weigh the cost. Usually negative cycles and negative habits and negative inclinations have a big cost. It can cost us our marriage. It can cost us the well-being of our children. It can cost us sleepless nights. It can cost us our home. I knew a man whose mother had won the lottery and she bought a bunch of property in this country. She bought a lot of property and left this man with a lot, a lot of property. And because this man had this sinful cycle of gambling and gambling and gambling and it was just a cycle, he lost everything. When his mother died, she left him everything and he lost everything. Even gambling can be a cycle that can cost us much. We can end up losing our home. We can end up losing the things that we have that, that God has provided for us, for our family. It's so weigh the cost. Because whatever you don't stop, it's going to end up killing your dreams, killing what God has designed you for, stopping your ministry, stopping your calling. So weigh the cost. Is it gonna cost you your marriage? Is it gonna cost you your relationship with your children? Because if it is, it's a way that you can say, you know what, I'm gonna put a stop to this. I'm not gonna allow this to end my marriage. I'm not gonna allow this to stop this relationship that I'm trying to build with my children. Number two, what did Phineas do? He made a decision. The Bible says that in the middle of all of this, what was happening, that Phineas stood up. He chose to stand up. It takes only one person to say, I'm gonna stand. And you know what, I wanna do something prophetically right now. How about you stand? But before you stand, how about you say, I'm gonna stand. Go ahead, one, two, three, I'm gonna stand. And you stand up like a Phineas. Okay, sit back down, that was good, right? That was just to make sure that if you're falling asleep, you know, I got you, got the blood pumping. So you're gonna stand and you're gonna say, you know what, I'm gonna make a decision right now. It's gonna stop. 
It's going to stop. I know I heard a man once say that whatever ran into my family, it stops when it ran into me. Amen? It will not run into my, into my family and my descendants and the people that I'm with and the people that I am raising up, the next generation. So it ran in my family until it ran into me. Divorce ran in my family until it ran into me. Depression ran into my family until it ran into me. Gambling ran in my family until it ran into me. Um, unforgiveness and bitterness and, and rage and anger ran in my family until it ran into me. Amen? It doesn't have to get past you. This wasn't going to get past Phineas. He's like, no, I'm going to put a stop. So he stays. He makes a decision. He stands up. And what does Phineas do? He goes into the tent and he kills whatever was happening there. He killed it. He pulled, a, he pulled a plug. He said, no, nope, no more. No more dishonoring God. No more, um, no more disruptive and dis, disrupt, destructive cycles. No more. He pulled the plug. You know, and that's easier said than done. Right? You can say, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop drinking tomorrow. I'm going to stop um, smoking that tomorrow. I'm going to stop taking that tomorrow. I'm going to stop talking like that tomorrow. You can say that, but it's easier said than done, right? How many of you know it's easier said than done? Monday comes around and you're like, ugh, you get angry. This is what happens. You get angry at work and then you come home and you want to unwind. And so then you get wine, right? And then you drink a wine and then you unwind. And then you unwind so much that everyone has to pay for your unwinding. Right? And so that's a cycle. That's a vicious cycle. There's nothing worse for a child to come into a place, into a home, where they're supposed to find comfort and peace and love. And what they find is somebody with a bottle of wine unwinding in a very negative and violent way. And so, you, so I know that it's easier said than done. But you got to work at it. Pastor Steve told me, you got to work at it. He gave me the advice, you have to work at it. It doesn't happen overnight. You depend on God and for God to give you the grace, for God to give you the, the power to do it, for God to give you the strength to change. You, you keep going to God. God, help me. I'm not going to go to the wine. I'm not going to go to the 40. I'm not going to go to the tequila. I'm going to God. Amen? I'm not going to go gamble away my paycheck. I'm going to go to God. You know? I'm not going to go gamble every, my hard work that should be providing for my home. I'm going to go to God. I'm going to go pay my tithe. I'm, I'm not going to let money have a grip on me like Pastor Tyler said, right? You decide to pull the plug and you work at it. If you mess up, you work at it again. If you mess up, you work at it again. And guess what? While you're working at it, the Holy Spirit is building in you this fruit called self-control. And all of a sudden, one day you wake up and what was hard yesterday is easy today because God gave you self-control. You got to keep working at it. You can't say, oh man, I messed up. That's it. I'm done. Forget it. I'm not a Phineas. No. You do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again, right? No one learned how to play the guitar overnight. Practice makes perfect. Well, self-control, you have to practice self-control for you to be able to know how to do self-control. And number four, the last thing that Phineas was able to see was he was able to see God act. The Bible says that after Phineas did this amazing and courageous act, of making a decision against all of these iniquities and, and sinful ways that Phineas was able to see God act. And how did God act? Because do you know that God honors every step of faith that you take? God honors every step of faith that you take. Every little step, God honors it. And God honored Phineas's courageous step of faith. And how did he honor it? He said, you know what? I make a covenant of peace with you, Phineas. That was his very exact words. I make a covenant of peace. Because how many of you know you can't buy peace, right? You can have all the money in the world. You can have a Tesla that drives you to work, but you cannot buy peace. Peace can only be given by the Prince of Peace. And who wants to walk into their home and feel peace? Yes, amen. 
How many children here want to walk into their home and feel peace, right? That mom and dad know how to act. That mom and dad know how to submit to God. That mom and dad know how to run to God and not the other way. Peace. God made a covenant of peace with Phineas. And not only that, God did this with Phineas. It's so beautiful, and we find it. Go with me to, Phine- uh, to Numbers 25. It's so beautiful, this last part here. Numbers 25, and I'm just going to jump into 13. 25, 13. Uh, 12, let's go to 12. Therefore, I declare, I grant him my covenant of peace. And then this is what he says. It will be a covenant of perpetual priesthood for him and his future descendants because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the Israelites. So who did he make a covenant with? Not only Phineas, but his descendants. A perpetual priesthood. No more, no more will our, our, our descendants will be um, addicted and uh, stuck in, in this divorce uh, cycle or, or depressed. But now they're going to be priests. Amen? No longer gambling away their lives. Now they're priests. No longer full of, of, of bitterness and resentment. Now they're priests. No more violence and, and anger and rage. Now they're priests. Do you see how God honors what we do when we say no more? When we say, you know what? I'm going to take a step of faith and I'm going to stop this behavior. I'm going to stop this behavior because I see how it's affecting everyone around me. I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to pull the plug. I'm going to rely on God and trust in God that he'll give me the ability, the capacity to do this. And then you see God act. Then you enjoy the peace. You know, Solomon's reign was peaceful. Why? Because of all the battles that David won. And parents, when you win battles, your children will benefit from all the battles that you win. And unfortunately, I don't come from a perfect pedigree. None of us are here perfect. None of us, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, right? But God makes a way. God makes a new way. God makes a way for us to be able to enjoy blessings and not be stuck in curses. And all we have to do is have faith, repent. The cure for any cycle is repentance, turning back to God, obeying God. So I would like for you to stand right now because I am in the presence of Phineas's. There are Many Phineases here. I imagine that there are 200 Phineases here. What you do today matters. The battles that you win today matters. There's times when I look at families and I see how blessed they are. And I think and I wonder, wow, that's so amazing. And you want to know what I see? I see the fruit of parents that prayed. Of parents that were like Phineas and said no more. And I'm going to be a Phineas. Even though my parents weren't Phineases, I'm going to be the Phineas. So when Elijah and Zoe and Belen get older, they will have less battles. And they will be able to enjoy peace during their reign. And they'll be able to enjoy that abundant life. It all starts with me. Because everything is tied to choices. And so what's your choice today, uh, church? What's today? Is your choice today, is your decision today to be a Phineas? Is your decision today to say, no, it's not going to get past me. I'm going to stop right now. And I know that's hard. Yes, she told me it was going to be hard. But God's power is made perfect in weakness. And his grace is sufficient. And God has given us the Holy Spirit to equip us and empower us. Do you feel empowered? Do you feel that you can? Yes, lift up your hands if you feel, I am a Phineas. Look at all the Phineases here. Lift up your hands really high 
If you feel like you're a Phineas, that you're more than a conqueror, that you're not a victim, you're a victorious person in Christ Jesus, that you haven't been given a mind of, of addiction, that you've given you've been given the mind of Christ, that you were made in God's image. Amen. I'm going to pray over you and there's going to be something supernatural that happens today. You're going to get the anointing of Phineas. You're going to stand up and stop the plague in your family. Nobody else is going to have to pay for this plague. No one else is going to have to continue on with the same battle because you're a Phineas today.